From Hollywood, it's time now for Edmund O'Brien as... Johnny Dollar. This is Mr. Lavery at Washington Life. Are you available for an assignment? Yes, I am, Mr. Lavery. Fine. You'll have to go to New Mexico, a little town near Gallup. That's all right. What's the case? We want to look into the death of a Merrill Kent. It was generally accepted that his death was the result of an accident, and he was buried day before yesterday. On that same day, the police received information to the effect that he was murdered. Well, this kind of thing can be awkward. No autopsy, I suppose. No, arranging one will be your first job. If the man was murdered, we want to find out. Edmund O'Brien in a transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Washingtonian Life Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Merrill Kent matter. Expense account item one, $145, transportation via air, train, and finally, rented car from Hartford to Fort Scott, New Mexico, which is a small village where the law is attended by a deputy sheriff named York. After I checked into a hotel, I met him in his cubbyhole of an office. Well, I don't know what to think about the darn thing. Get everything all settled, and then some blame fool riles it up again. Was it a local phone call? Local? Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, a month ago, I could have found out who made it just by asking the operator. He used to have their finger on everything in town, but, well, we got a dial system now. I didn't recognize her voice because she was, uh, oh, tricking it up. What did she say? Yeah, she called while the funeral was going on, you know. Yeah, I understood that. Yeah, she said something from the Bible and that she couldn't stay silent while the good man's body was being uh, uh, submitted to the grave, as she put it. Then she said she wasn't sure enough to accuse anybody out in the open, but that she thought Mr. Kent had been murdered. No more than that? Didn't she name anybody? No, no. She just hung up. Yeah. Isn't much to start from, is it? No, no. You know, I knew Kent. He was a good horseman, but better ones have been killed the same way. See, the horse falls and the rider's foot slips through the stirrup. Then when the horse gets up, he panics with his thing stuck there and dragging at him. He doesn't have to run a hundred yards, and the man's dead. Well, Kent's horse must have run three miles. How do you know that? Well, the way he was blown when he got back to the ranch. He dragged Kent all the way home, you know. But you don't know where it happened, huh? No. No, Kent bred horses and was out all the time exercising them, so it could have happened any place. I just say the man had some hard luck. He's dead and buried, and as far as I'm concerned, that should be the end of it. Yeah, you're probably right. The insurance company has a sizable investment to protect if they can. They want an autopsy, so I guess we'll have to have one. Well, how do you figure on working that out? I know the widow won't okay one, and some survivor has to in this state. Have you talked to her about this? No, no, but she's been through enough as it is. Why should I want to open it up again? You'd think she'd want to know if her husband was murdered or not. She doesn't know anything about the phone call. She doesn't? I didn't think it was worth telling her about. I'm afraid you'll have to be told, but I'll spare you the trouble. In a small town like this, I know it's tough. Yeah, that's right, it is. Uh, who was the doctor that was called the the one that signed the death certificate? His name's Snyder. Yeah, thanks. Where's his office? It's in his house down on Elm Street, Second Street just past the hotel. I'll find it. Thanks again, Sheriff. Sorry I have to stir things up. I'll do it as quietly as I can. <laughs> Right then, I didn't know how to figure the sheriff. It was fairly obvious that he didn't approve of what I was doing. For the time being, I charged it off to the fact that no law officer enjoys the possibility that a crime might have gone unpunished right under his nose. Dr. Hugo Snyder's shingle on a white fence identified the address on Elm Street. A side door led to his office waiting room. I was met there by a woman in a nurse's uniform. Good afternoon, sir. How do you do? Dr. Snyder in? Yes, but he's busy at the moment. Do you have an appointment? No, I don't. I'm not a patient. I, uh... Well, here, I have to talk to him about something else. Here's my card. Insurance investigator? That's right. Uh, 
Mr. Dollar, please don't think me an overly inquisitive nurse. I'm Mrs. Snyder. Oh, well, that does make a difference. I want to talk to him about a death he attended a little while ago. Mr. Merrill Kent. Mr. Kent? Yes, the company that held his life policy sent me. Oh, I see. They think an investigation is needed. Huh? There's a chance, yes. That's what I wanted to talk to the doctor about. If I can see him now. He's in the x-ray lab. I'll see if he can come out. Hugo. Yes, what is it? There's a gentleman here to see you. It's about Merrill Kent. What about him? I don't know, dear. He's an investigator from an insurance company. All right, I'll be right out. I hope you'll excuse me for being curious. Surely. Is it a usual thing in cases like this to have an investigation? Not exactly. It probably should be, but unless something about a case seems to call for looking into, nothing is done. How do you do? Dr. Snyder? Uh, this is Mr. Dollar. Yes. You're an insurance investigator, Mr. Dollar? Yes, a rare thing in Fort Scott, I take it. Here's his card, dear. Yes, I... I don't understand why you're here. What is it about Merrill Kent? Well, it could be I'm on a fool's errand, Dr. Snyder. It wouldn't be the first one. But the day of Kent's funeral, Sheriff York got a phone call from somebody who hinted that his death wasn't accidental. Why, that's ridiculous. Of course it was accidental. He was dragged to death by a horse. And the first people to see him were his wife and her brother, who notified you, right? That's right. Harris phoned me, and I went right out. Yeah. Now, you as a doctor realize that you can't diagnose a patient's condition without examining them. Same thing holds for this situation. I say that because I want you to understand that the things I'm going to bring up are only possibilities. Of course. The symptoms I work on. Now, how long did it take you to get to the Kent Ranch after you were called? No more than 15 minutes. And Kent was dead when you got there? Yes, and probably had been for some time. Where was the body when you first saw it? Near the corral. Harris had brought blankets out. I don't know what hopes he must have had that Kent was alive, but he put blankets on the ground and one over him. Then his foot wasn't stuck in the stirrup when you got there. No, no, Harris had freed him as soon as he could. And you couldn't swear that his foot had ever been in the stirrup, could you? Good Lord, Mr. Dollar, now I... Now, wait a minute, Doctor, please. Please, these are only possibilities. Did you see his boot? Marks must have been left on it. Did you examine his ankle? Must have been bruised or wrenched. Oh, of course I didn't. I wasn't concerned with his ankle or his boot. Well, did anyone look at them? Sheriff York wasn't called in at all, was he? No, because it was a clear case of accident. What about his hands and his arms? And his clothes must have been torn to shreds. I didn't notice. He was covered from his shoulders down, as I remember. Well, who would have noticed? What about the undertaker? The body was taken to Leesburg that same evening, the Weinrich Mortuary. It's about 15 miles north of here. How about your examination, Doctor? Would you tell me about it? Well, very little was necessary. He died as a result of severe multiple fractures of the skull. And I don't suppose you could tell which of these fractures was the fatal one? No, of course not. Or which was the first one? Of course I couldn't. Then he could have been hit on the head by somebody and then dragged by the horse, couldn't he? I signed a certificate to the effect that his death was accidental. I firmly believe that it was. Now, nobody doubts your sincerity, Doctor, but you'll have to admit... But since somebody has mentioned murder, there are some angles that could stand looking into. I tell you, there aren't. But what do you propose to do? We're going to order an autopsy. Kent had a sister living in Seattle. She's on her way here in case we need her authority to get one. I want to thank you both, and I hope I won't have to bother you again. Good day, Mr. Dollar. Hi, Sheriff. Oh, how you getting along? It's hard to tell yet, but the doctor's death certificate could be full of holes. How do you figure that? It's nothing against him, but he had to admit the cause of death didn't have to be accidental. He said that? Yeah, so I want to find out everything I can about Kent before I see the widow. Assuming the possibility of murder for a minute, can 
Can you think of anybody that could have done it? No, no, I can't think of anybody. Mm. How'd he get along in town? Was he well-liked? Well, he didn't have much to do with the town. He was away a lot to horse shows and sales, things like that. How long would he be away on these trips? Oh, I don't know. I never kept tabs on that. No reason to. He'd take Mrs. Kent with him? Well, most often he didn't, I'd say. She seemed to be here pretty steady. Do you have any idea how they got along? Oh, I wouldn't know anything about that. Never heard one way or another. Where is the Kent Ranch, Sheriff? Well, you turn to the left at Brian's store. It's out five and a half miles. Thanks. Oh, um, Mr. Dollar. Yeah? I know you think I'm acting kind of strange about this, and, well, I guess I am. These people are my friends, and you grow close together in a place this size. I told you I understood that. I guess I don't want any of them to turn out to be a killer. Have you remembered something that you want to tell me? No, no, it's nothing like that. I, I wouldn't lie to you. But it seems like you've got it in your mind that Maxine Kent might have had something to do with her husband dying. I didn't say that. Uh, everybody likes her, Mr. Dollar. Loves her, I guess is more like it. She was born here. Now, if you're going to make it rough on her, I'd watch my step if I was you. Thanks for the advice, Sheriff. The way you seem to feel, I wonder that you reported that phone call at all. <laughs> was quite a surprise. I'd halfway expected the layout to be like the village and the other ranches I'd passed, old and badly cared for. But the residence was chalk white with a tiled roof and long shaded verandas. Around it, the grounds were well groomed, and behind it were a few low white outbuildings. A woman I assumed to be the widow was standing at the edge of the drive as I pulled up. She was strikingly beautiful, in her mid-twenties with cold black hair and eyes, a kind of slim almost boyish figure they write about, and the complexion and color put there by the sun. I could see why the town felt the way they did about her. Well, Mr. Dollar? Yeah, I seem to have been preceded by my infamy. My brother's in town. He phoned me that you were on your way out. He didn't tell me where he'd learned it, but... I only told one man, Sheriff York. That isn't important. It really isn't. They're all doing what they think is right. They think they're helping me. But I can realize that all they've done is give you more and more reason for suspicion. Isn't that true? So far, yes. Come up on the veranda where we can sit down. Then you can tell me what to do. Sure. Mm. Hi, chair. This is fine. I made up my mind that I wouldn't go to pieces, but if I do, you'll have to forgive me. How do I order an autopsy when everything... when the funeral... All that's needed is your signature, Mrs. Kent, on a form that says you'll authorize one. I will. If it's the right thing to do, I'll do it. Is that all? As far as I'm concerned, yes. The rest of it will be up to the county. They'll ask if you suspect anyone. I don't. I don't suspect anyone. They'll ask who you suspect of calling the police. But I don't suspect anyone. Well, it'll be up to the coroner's jury. Sign as Kent, I don't know if you can understand that, that because of the phone call, I couldn't do anything but press I this. I don't understand. I don't understand any of it, but I'll do what's right. Unless there's something else, I wish you'd go now. I drove away from the ranch, I would have given my salary and a lot more if I could have skirted the village and kept right on going. I still wish I had. You the guy from the insurance company? That's right. Where's Sheriff York? He's over at Doc Snyder's. Just phoned and said if you showed up to get right over there. Why? Mrs. Snyder killed herself. She left a letter. She said she was the one who made the phone call that started this whole thing. We will return you to yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. 
Gangbusters shouldn't have relatives. That would seem to be the moral of the exciting gangbusters case tonight. Here are the case of the talkative boy, in which a crook is corralled through telling testimony furnished to San Francisco police by his young nephew. Don't miss Gangbusters with another action-packed story based on police records tonight on most of these same CBS radio stations. Now with our star, Edmund O'Brien, we bring you the second act of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Sheriff York? Briefly, yeah. What's the story? Well, the doctor was in the office, and he called for Mrs. Snyder. She didn't answer, and when he came out to look for her, he found her in there, in the parlor. She was dead on the couch. The note. What else did it say except that she was the one that phoned you? It's there on the table. There's something about there was nothing behind it but false suspicion and wrecking her life beyond repair. I don't know. It's kind of wandering. What kind of false suspicion? Her husband and Mrs. Kent? It looks that way. Come on, we'll go on in. You can read it yourself. Yeah. Where's the doctor? He's in his room. Alone? Here, through here. Yeah, that's the way he wanted it. He's mighty busted up over it. Have you reported the county yet? I called him as soon as I got here. Some men are on the way. Well, there she is. I covered her up. You know, she never seemed like a person that'd kill herself. The note was addressed to whom it may concern, but I won't attempt to quote it. The main idea was that she had been driven to phone Sheriff York by a blind suspicion of her husband's feelings towards Maxine Kent. Then, when she learned these suspicions were groundless, she realized that there was no longer any chance for happiness. The closing words begged her husband's forgiveness and swore to his innocence. Sheriff York would rather not go with me, but he guessed it would be all right if I talked to the doctor. Yes, things haven't cleared up very quickly, have they? No, oh, Scott has accomplished a great deal. I suppose I was being too objective. I meant the two lives have been ruined since you arrived. The wives of my own. You didn't mean that I ruined them. No, no, of course not. Circumstances. Circumstances that should have been entirely harmless and not even known. You must understand me. I'm not defensing no reason to anymore. Those circumstances drove your wife to breaking the case open with you in the middle. Her own version of it. I am in love with Maxine Kent. I have been. If I'd been selfish and divorced my wife, and Maxine had done the same, none of this would have had the meaning that it has now. But one doesn't do things like that in a small town unless one is prepared to leave. We weren't. Why not? The doctor's money is nothing. She had none. But we were intelligent people. We had control of our emotions. So we talked and decided not to see each other again. I admit I lied to my wife. Not well. She suspected the truth. When Kent was killed, I think she lost her mind with doubt. You did say killed, didn't you? Yes. I mustn't forget that my motive is now public, isn't it? That part of her note will be remembered. That she realized she was wrong isn't important, is it? That depends. By itself, this is a good story, all of it. But it falls to pieces when it's told by the doctor who signed Merrill Kent's death certificate. Yes, I suppose it does. But it's the truth. If it is, you can prove it. Where were you the afternoon Kent was killed? Sometimes you can't prove the truth. I was in the office, working with my wife. Then why did she think you had killed him? Because she left for about an hour to shop. What did you do during that time? I came here to this room and rested. Is there any way to prove that? Anyone see you? No. You can't prove it. It's not the truth. If you can, it holds up better in court. You're convinced that I'm guilty, aren't you? All I can do is work with what's at hand. If you are, you'd better plead it. If you aren't, you'd better keep your fingers crossed for a quick confession from someone else. Mr. Dollar, tell me, has it been proved that he was murdered? The autopsy should be underway by tomorrow afternoon. Kent's sister has arrived. We don't need her. His widow is authorizing one. I see. Anything more to say? No. I don't think there's anything you want to say. The deputies from County.
County headquarters arrived at 6.30 p.m. Down their orders, Dr. Snyder was removed to the single cell of the Fort Scott jail. He wasn't questioned that evening, but the headquarters men quite pointedly had their doubts that his wife's death was due to suicide. When I'd given them everything I had, I drove back to the Kent Ranch. This time, I wasn't met by the beautiful widow. A man stood waiting for me at the edge of the driveway. Hello. I saw your lights coming up the road. I came to see Mrs. Kent. I'm sorry, she's not here. Where is she? She had to go to Santa Fe. I'm her brother. Can I do anything for him? I don't need any help, thanks. We'll have the Santa Fe police pick her up. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. It's a pretty sudden trip to Santa Fe, wasn't it? No, she does this a couple of times a month. It's not as close as Albuquerque, but she likes it better. Your name, Dollar? How soon did she leave after Mrs. Snyder killed herself? I think it was before. Couldn't have been. I was here. Here with Maxine? You people ought to get your signal straight. She said you phoned her that I was on my way out from town. How come you didn't know it? Or didn't you really call? Uh, you're right. Things got confusing. Oh, they sure did. Where's your sister? It's true. She's in Santa Fe. I told her not to go because everything she did like that was making it look worse. That's right. Why'd she go? When she heard about the doc's wife, she flew apart. Until then, she was sure Kent hadn't been murdered. When that happened, she seemed to change her mind. I guess we can charge it off to the old beat-up prerogative women are supposed to have. I'll run back to my hotel and uh, get some sleep. Wait just a second. I want to tell you this. Whatever happened, Maxie didn't have anything to do with it. What did happen? I don't know. I'm no expert. I was here when the horse dragged Kent in. I took his foot out of the stirrup and laid him down. Maybe I should have waited until the governor came. I don't know. Anyway, you took him down. To me, he was dragged to death. But you say he might have been hit on the head by somebody. I don't know. Doc Snyder? I don't know. Did you see him out here that afternoon? No. As far as I'm concerned, he quit coming out a couple of weeks ago. Before that, he kept after Maxine. She told me that. Then she made him stop. How'd she stop him? She told him she couldn't divorce Kent. You're trying to clear her, and that's natural. I'd like to see the truth come out. Well, let's work on that, then. When was the last time your sister and Snyder were together? A couple of weeks ago. I didn't hear it, but I was here when she told him it had to stop. That was the last time he came out. Did she meet him any place? No, and I'm sure of that. I made it my business to find out where she went and who she saw. She never met him. Did he phone her? Yes, but it finally got to the point where I'd answer the phone and she wouldn't talk to him. Do you know if she ever phoned him? I don't think she did. I don't know why she should. What are you driving at? I want to find out if Snyder could have discovered that Kent was out riding that afternoon. If he could have found out where he was going and could have met him. My sister couldn't have told him because she didn't know. You sure, then? She was in her room resting. I'm the only one who knew where he was going. Are you still protecting him? It's the truth. I talked to him just before he left. He was breaking this horse to shoot off of, and he went out toward McNeil Canyon to find some jackrabbits. They'd make better witnesses if they could talk. Have to have your sister picked up. How soon will that order go out? Why? I just thought she might get hold of herself and come back tonight. It'll be a break if you could wait till morning. She didn't ask for a break by leaving. I'll think it over and check back with you. The next day, things moved slowly. Mrs. Kent did come back on her own and signed for an autopsy. I didn't see her. By that evening, her husband's body had been exhumed. By noon the following day, the coroner's report was out. There was no actual post-mortem evidence of murder, but the openings were still there. Considering the circumstances, there was no proof that it wasn't murder either. The inquest verdict was the familiar death by misadventure, or at the hands of person or persons unknown. Dr. Snyder and the body of his wife were carted off to the county seat for more questioning and examination. And I spent the rest of the day with Sheriff York and a flock of volunteer citizens going over everything we had from the beginning again. It was a long, hot afternoon. After a shower and some food that evening, I started back to the Kent Ranch. You again, Dollar? Thought you'd be through with us since Doc Snyder was arrested. Not quite. Your sister here? What do you want with it? I want to talk to her, give her my apologies. Apologies? If I hadn't noticed the side of you, that would bother with him. Is she here? She's too upset to be bothered. Ask Mr. Dollar in, Harry. Why are you liking that way? Thank you, Mrs. Kent. Please come in. 
Why'd you run out the other night, Miss Kent? I don't know. And Hugo's wife... I lost my head. She came back, didn't she? I'm glad she did. She had nothing to run away from. What do you mean? Well, we're satisfied now that your husband's death was accidental. <laughs> you know, Miss Dollar? I was with Sheriff York. We went out toward McNeil Canyon. Found the spot where it happened. Your husband fired a rifle. We found it. His horse reared and fell. The marks in the ground show that. It was dragged from there. There are traces of that, too. It's over. It's over. No. Oh, they believe me now. Expense account item two, miscellaneous, $88.40. Item three, same as item one, transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, $378.40. Remarks? I'm sorry about the happy ending, the fact that everybody told the truth and that nobody was a criminal, and that the insurance claim is as good as New Mexico gold. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly, Johnny Dollar stars Edmund O'Brien in the title role and is written by Gil Dowd with music by Wilbur Hatch. Edmund O'Brien will soon be seen starring in a Paramount Pictures production, Silver City. Featured in tonight's cast were Ray Hartman, Joseph Kearns, Jeanette Nolan, Edgar Barrier, Virginia Gregg, and High Everbank. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. <laughs> Clarence Cassell inviting you to join us next week at this time when Edmund O'Brien returns as yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Edmund O'Brien again. I'd like to speak to you for a moment about one of the most important duties of American citizens. Today, every American has an opportunity to share in our common defense effort. And right now, this opportunity has become a duty for all of us. The armed forces of the United States need blood, our blood. The Korean campaign has gravely depleted the supply on hand, and this must be replenished if we are to afford our servicemen the protection they are giving us. No matter what your age, sex, or station in life, you can contribute to American defense by donating a pint of your blood to the men of your Army, Navy, Air Force, or Marines. Call your local blood donor center or Red Cross chapter today for an appointment. Remember, your donation of blood may save the life of a wounded serviceman. Give your blood today to save a life tomorrow. Partners, if you're looking for exciting Western adventure, you've come to the right network. Every Saturday on CBS Radio, most of these same stations bring you the Gene Autry Show and Bill Boyd as Hopalong Cassidy. Listen tonight. Stay tuned now for the Bond Monroe Show, which follows immediately over most of these same stations. Every Saturday evening on the CBS Radio Network.